Dennis, why don't we get started? Good afternoon, I'm Dennis Galecki, and welcome to the 401st Imagine Buffalo program and our 22nd virtual lecture hosted by our wonderful Buffalo and Erie County Public Library. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, this program is created by the Center for the Study of Arts and Architecture, History and Nature, and ImagineLifelongLearning.com. Now, we're going to start with our speaker shortly, but first, a little housekeeping. Everyone watching will be muted during our speaker's presentation, which will last about 15 minutes or so. We will have time for questions at the end. Uh, so if you do have a question, please type it into the chat box and we'll get to as many as we can. This program is being recorded. You'll be able to watch it again later on the library's Facebook and YouTube channels. Uh, those can be found, those links can be found at the uh, uh, homepage for the Buffalo and Erie County Public Library. As a reminder, we'll be here on Zoom every Tuesday at 1230 uh, with the same uh, link and the great lineup of local speakers. Now, today is the fourth Tuesday of the month where we focus on nature and science with the theme of imagine a healthy, wealthy, and sustainable community. Therefore, imagine place-based lifelong learning. Our featured speaker is Jay Burney. Jay is the Special Projects Director of the Pollinator Conservation Association, a founder of, of our Outer Harbor Coalition, and the U.S. Chair of the Birds on the Niagara International Birding Festival, which finished its third year over Valentine's Day weekend with a virtual event. Today, our international communities are facing resiliency challenges due to disease, climate change, habit loss, social concerns, and economic dysfunction. Jay Burney's work focuses on resiliency and the intersections between environment, culture, and the economy. He makes the case that the environment must always be the bottom line and that our region is a global hemispheric and regional jewel whose stewardship is critical if we expect future generations to have a positive quality of life, yours and my grandchildren. And now let's welcome Jay Burney, who is going to talk about creating a resilient city in the time of climate change. Jay? Hey, uh, thank you, Dennis. Um, let me get my uh, screen up here. I assume you can see that. Yep. So uh, thank you very much. It's great to be here. Um, my topic, uh, creating a resilient city in the time of climate change, it's a big topic. and. Uh, uh, there's a lot to do, and obviously uh, what we have to do is create a foundation, which is a lot of the work that, that I do. Uh, I work for the Pollinator Conservation Association. I'm the Special Projects Director, and as part of that, um, I've also uh, been chairing and running uh, a recent conference uh, festival called the Birds of the Niagara, which just concluded over the, uh, the Valentine's Day weekend. Um, the purpose of both of these is to uh, do advocacy education promote appropriate economic development, conservation, and resiliency. Now I can't get my screen to go when you know it. All right, there we go. So uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about climate change today and um, I, I've got a lot to say about everything I talked about is infused with the, the subtext of climate change. Uh, it's here, it's effect, gonna affect us for generations and centuries. And um, how do our resiliency strategies influence this as citizens, as businesses, as, and as institutions? And uh, if you have any challenges to what I'm saying, a question about what I'm saying, let's hold that to the question uh, and answer period. So we're going to be talking about learning resiliency because that's, that's kind of what we all have to do. Um, 
our species in order to survive, our communities in order to survive, and our culture depends on finding and investing in uh, resilient strategies. Uh, that involves something called sustainability, which is the old fashioned word of saying resiliency, uh, which is a link between environment, culture, and economy, uh, and how those se sectors interact with, in my opinion, um, it, more than my opinion, uh, science shows that the environment has to be the bottom line. Uh, nature, biodiversity, if we do this right, uh, we can have a survivable and thrivable future. Survivable is important, got to get there first. So uh, that's just an old fashioned way of looking at uh, those sustainability, resiliency links, economy, society, and environment underlying all of it. So uh, learning resiliency uh, is about advocacy, education, science, consulting, design, planning. This is the kind of work that I do. Uh, this picture is a group of students from UB working on the Outer Harbor. I do a lot of work in the Outer Harbor. Uh, this second picture is a group of us that are actually installing a site. Uh, we do science. This is a monarch butterfly that we've tagged with students. Uh, monarch butterflies is an important part of pollinator conservation because they're so iconic. And we just do science with, with uh, students. PollinatorConservationAssociation.org. You can look us up, a lot of information there. Uh, we work with citizen science. Citizen science is really important. It's one of our fundamental uh, aspects of how do we learn to build a foundation for resiliency. Uh, last year, we did a project on the Outer Harbor called the Outer Harbor Fall BioBlitz. And people, anybody with a phone that, that wants to participate can go and uh, take re record uh, what they're finding. We do that through iNaturalist. And as you can see in this map on the left, uh, those are all the sites just during a short period of time last summer and fall uh, where people were making observations about what's there. This is, um, you know, building a resiliency foundation, trying to know what's there, because that area, the Outer Harbor, which we talk about a lot, is often described as vacant, undeveloped um, wasteland. It's not. Uh, these are the kinds of things that we find there. And um, these are some of the reports that we got in through our bio blitz. And um, it just, it's nice database. Uh, you, you can take a picture, you take a picture. It shows you where you found it, when you found it, who the observer was, a lot of great data that comes out of that. So Pollinator Conservation Association also uh, installs sites, designs sites, manages and maintains sites. On the left, that's an Outer Harbor site that we have, Outer Harbor State Park. We're you know, bringing back some sand habitat. That's an old beach path that we've, we recreated. Uh, if you've been to the Outer Harbor State Park, it's not so much um, beach and sand and, uh, and wildness as it is parking lot, but we're working on it. We're building a great place there. Uh, these are other pictures of other sites uh, that we're working on. And we do this kind of work that's really part of what we do to build resiliency as we we, um, as we learn, we're actually installing conservation sites. Uh, this picture on the left is new conservation site we're doing on Grand Island on the West River Parkway. We're having a lot of success. We've been doing this for several years now and um, all of our sites are attracting uh, biodiversity, birds, butterflies, native plants. Um, it's, it's just really the success is, is right there and it's working and it's working for all of us if we know how to do it and we're learning how to do it. One of our projects that I've done for a lot of years is Times Beach Nature Preserve. It's on the Outer Harbor. I'll talk about the Outer Harbor a lot today. This picture on the left is a view of Times Beach from the top of City Hall. Uh, it's right downtown. It's right across the Buffalo River. It's right on the waterfront. It's an important location. Uh, it anchors the Outer Harbor in terms of biodiversity. It's a nature preserve. Uh, these are just some shots of this beautiful downtown place, uh, full of nature, full of birds, full of fish, full of insects, good insects. Uh, and just a great place to look at the sky and uh, look at nature and, and go out and relax and hike. Um, the Outer Harbor um, is a place that's uh, right on the waterfront. And what you're looking at here is uh, break walls at the top. Th those lines of break walls are really important in terms of our resiliency and our, our contemporary resiliency. But as you can see, there's a lot of green space on the Outer Harbor. Uh, the orange dot on the right is basically City Hall and then uh, all the waterfront green spaces. Um, you know, essentially habitat. It's not undeveloped, um, vacant um, wasteland. It's fragile, but we can make it resilient. So we have a lot of connections. Uh, that outer harbor connects to the Niagara River Strait. Niagara River uh, goes from Lake Erie to Lake Ontario, and um, it's it's habitat all the way up. It's been damaged. It's been changed. Uh, but it's a place that we have, for instance, the Niagara River Greenway. We're doing a lot of work in that corridor. Um, and one of the things that we have there is called the Niagara River Globally Significant Important Bird Area. Uh, that's a, it's a rare designation that makes us recognized around the globe as an important place for birds. We also have a Ramsar wetlands of international importance, which means we have an important place of biodiversity. So important 
uh, is our area, um, our biodiversity, our threatened and rare and unusual species. And in the case of birds, sometimes globally significant portions of, of the whole world population. We have some birds here that are in major proportions at certain seasons migrating. Uh, and so um, this is a corridor that's important for birds. Uh, it's similar to the Galapagos, similar to the Everglades, similar to Yellowstone. Uh, this is how important we are. We, we are. we are similar to those places. Why is biodiversity important? Um, it's the basis of biological life, including human life. And biodiversity helps us to create clean water, clean air, healthy humans, a balanced atmosphere, and it truly, biodiversity truly, nature truly uh, underpin our economy and our economy depends on a healthy planet. North America, we're in the Great Lakes. What a wonderful place. We're connected to this area um, physically, um, emotionally, spiritually, um, physically. Let's talk about that. Uh, we're right in the middle of this. Um, Great Lakes is 20% of the world's fresh surface water. That's pretty critical. Uh, the Niagara River Strait, the picture on the left, runs from Buffalo up to um, Lake Ontario. And again, that's a focus of a lot of work that I do. We're also connected by watersheds. Uh, this map on the right is basically showing the Great Lakes watersheds. All of that water impacts us and we impact it. Earth is a rare paradise. Look at that, that's where we live. That's an unusual place. We don't know of any other place in the universe that looks like that, that does that. What is it? It's a biological entity. It's a living entity. It's where we live. We may be the only life in the universe. We'll find out if there was life on Mars soon, I hope. But, you know, this is a rare paradise. This is where we live. We have to take care of it. And we're in deep trouble. Um, we have rapidly declining biodiversity. Our insect populations are plummeting. Bird populations are plummeting. All of these resources, natural resources, are plummeting. And uh, these are all fundamental causations of human-created climate change. Let me repeat that. This loss of biodiversity is a fundamental cause of climate change. Here's another connection that we have. All those lines go right to the uh, Niagara River corridor. Uh, these are bird migration lines and insect migration lines. We have birds that come and go to the Arctic, that come and go to the Amazon, that come and go to the Caribbean, Central America, Mexico, and the boreal forest on the West Coast. It's one of the reasons we have the globally significant IBA. This is a rough map of that IBA. Uh, we don't have enough science to know exactly what the important bird area should be, but we know that they use this whole corridor and we know that we need more science. We need to learn the resiliency of that area in order to protect birds better and biodiversity. Bird in the top left, uh, snowy owl is an Arctic bird. It comes here in the winter time uh, seeking habitat. The birds in the center top, these are um, barn swallows. They nest here, they breed here, they create babies here and they go to the Amazon in the winter. And so in a very real way, what we do here helps protect the Amazon, helps protect the Arctic because it helps uh, create, defend and conserve biodiversity. All of these animals that you see in these pictures we have here, including the monarch butterflies, which come here in droves during their migration. They stop at Times Beach and probably in your backyard. They need habitat in order to survive. So we need to find out how to preserve, protect, and conserve vanishing habitat. And um, that's part of the job. That's part of the job of learning resiliency. Uh, the Niagara River in the winter is a really neat time. Um, that's why we did the Birds on Niagara um, Festival. We've done it three years. It's an international festival. It's the only international bird festival in North America. We have incredible birds here that are migrating, that are wintering. Uh, and uh, hundreds of thousands of birds in the Niagara River in the wintertime. And it's an ornithological event. Um, and um, they're all, many of them in breeding plumage. So we're glad to have them courting and doing that. So we have a Valentine's Day theme. And it's also an economic development tool because we can build tourism, ecotourism, uh, which is a huge industry, uh, and invest in conservation in order to build that uh, late winter uh, empty hotel rooms time of the year. We can bring lots of people. Um, this year, just this year, our virtual festival, we had over 100,000 people that, that tuned into us. That's a lot. A lot of great international partners. It's an international festival that's unusual and rare, uh, but we have great partners on both sides of the border to do this festival. Um, so I'm going to run through this very quickly, the last part of this. Uh, so here's some of the issues that we have. This is a picture of the break wall from LaSalle Park. Uh, that break wall, um, if you look at it closely, you can see it's got a lot of damage to it. That damage was done um, not too long ago by some storms that are climate change related. Uh, 
we this picture on the left is a plan by the uh, group called the Congress for New Urbanism several years ago to take the Outer Harbor, that green space, and turn it into a new sprawling community. Uh, this is a project on the bottom that came up during that process and same project here. Um, Times Beach would have been surrounded by condos, um, private development on this public land. Uh, develop, developers and development agencies, including the Erie Canal Harbor Development Agency, which runs this area, uh, think of this area as an undeveloped wasteland. Uh, a lot of people got upset. We got upset. We, we did protests. We had public meetings. We formed our Outer Harbor Coalition to talk about resiliency and talking about doing something other than expensive privatization and um, sprawl on the Outer Harbor. And um, a, lot of, a lot of public meetings, a lot of you came to those public meetings and um, it's not a wasteland out there. It's critical habitat. It's public space. Uh, keep the Outer Harbor green. If you're going to do development, do appropriate development. We can talk about what that is. We worked on projects like uh, um, what's the cultural landscape? Uh, can we create a park out there, which we want to do? And again, this map on the top right shows the Outer Harbor and shows its vulnerability. And I don't think sprawl on condos is a good place there. It's dangerous. It's dangerous to human life. It's expensive. And uh, we just think that a green resilient strategy will probably benefit future generations economically, socially, and ecologically. It improves our quality of life to have a, a green resilient space out there. So we had some wins. Uh, Erie Canal Harbor Development Corporation sort of came around instead of doing the condos, decided on a temporary basis, and I say that seriously, um, to make some green space, and, and they've done that. Um, but there's still a development agency, and uh, that's their their plan is is to develop the Outer Harbor at some point once um, public um, fever reduces, if that should happen, and it shouldn't happen because it, it's an institutional failure. Um, to let them do this, to, to have them do this. Um, they also have some interesting visions of what birds are in the outer harbor, but you know, that was fun. So in Halloween, Halloween of 2019, we had record high water in the Great Lakes and Lake Erie, hurricane force winds, a gigantic sash happened uh, and it hit the outer harbor. Um, this is just a few years ago now, hit it hard. Um, and uh, not everybody, just picture in the bottom left, there's someone actually out there sailing in that, in that storm. But, but so there's recreational opportunities, even in tragedies, but that storm hit the Outer Harbor really hard. The break walls were destroyed all around the city, uh, all and up and down the river, flooding Lake Erie, Lake Ontario, um, Niagara River, horrible flooding. Uh, Times Beach uh, was destroyed by that first storm. Uh, canal side was flooded by that first storm. I went to canal side and watched the water rise eight feet in about 30 minutes uh, that night of the storm. Um, this picture on the top right is this, one of the subsequent storms because we've had eight subsequent storms that have been major seiches and hurricane velocity winds since then. Uh, these are 500 year storms that are happening every couple of weeks, every couple of months at least. This picture is the Queen City Landing site, which is one of the development sites, and it was underwater. This debris right in front of us is at least five feet above the land level at Queen City Landing, and it was it, it just overtopped that area in Furman Boulevard. Um, so, so this has been very damaging. Uh, we have an issue. We have a, a problem. We have to make a more creative, um, resilient shoreline because. Um, it, we need to figure out how to save lives because not only is the outer harbor threatened and, and if people develop out there, they're going to die. If they live out there, they're going to die. Uh, if they visit out there, they're going to die in certain storms. Um, we have to figure out how to make it a more resilient area. Um, and that and that's about all of our coastlines. Quickly, uh, what a seish is, if you don't know, Lake Erie is shaped sort of like a bathtub. The wind gets blowing back and forth. It's a very shallow bathtub. And so these big wind events push the water. And when these hurricane force winds happen, uh, it, it just hits our end of the lake and buries us in water. And it, and it, it happens quite a lot. Uh, we have maybe 30 seishes a year, but we've had dramatic seishes the last couple of years like we've never had before or like we've rarely had before. And then we have winter out there too, which is, um, if you've ever been to Furman Boulevard during a a snowstorm, you know, you know it's life-threatening. Um, I know we're running late, Dennis. I just want to do a few more slides, if you don't mind. Um, we have an institutional failure with our agencies that are, are in charge of developing. Um, for instance, they announced a new general project plan just during the holidays after a year of dormancy, short public comment period. It's not about being a park. It's not about being resilient. It's about development. And although it looks green, um, it's, it's not. It doesn't address the issues that we need to have addressed. That's an institutional failure. It's a development agency. They shouldn't be handling this, this area. Uh, so they're, 
plans call for increased infrastructure. This is parking on some of the green space that, that's habitat, that's grasslands, rare grasslands, uh, native plants and birds use it and insects use it. And, and you know this is not a good thing. We'd like to see something like this on the bottom, which is more green space that's designed for resiliency and biodiversity. Um, there's a Restore Mother Nature Act that the governor proposed last year. It didn't work uh, because of the pandemic, but it's a $3 billion act. And we should look at that and look at that kind of money to do the kind of work. We're not, we're not you know, pulling these out of our, our, our ears. These, these are real things that we can create sustainable waterfronts. And the governor even had a plan, the legislator had a plan, investing in resilient infrastructure. We can do it. We have to build an institutional foundation in order to do it. And we don't seem to have any leadership um, go through really quickly, just last couple of things. We did end up beating this project for the time being. Uh, the developer is no longer proposing this, although that may come up again. Um, just quickly, part of resiliency is social justice, equity. Um, without peace, we can have no resiliency. We have to develop a culture that's resilient. It's not just about habitat, but the bottom line is habitat, but it has to be about inclusion. It has to be about equity. It has to be about justice. And I'm glad that we're doing this during uh, Black um, History Month, because if we don't figure out how to do these things within our culture, if we don't develop a culture resist of resiliency that involves everyone, uh, it's not going to work. We have to do it. We can do it. And eco economy, the traditional economic development is about uh, extracting money, and they don't measure things uh, like externalities, like the cost of a forest. If you take down a, a log, if you log a, a forest, the value is based on the cost of the lumber. It isn't based on what you take from the environment. You lose a forest, that's billions of dollars. You log a forest, that might be a few million dollars. We don't measure the billions of dollars in cost that society bears with climate change, with health. And so we can talk also about appropriate development. I'm just gonna work through this to the end. Um, we had a great project. Uh, the Birds in Niagara had some uh, um, a justice uh, speaker um, coloring the conservation conservation because conservation is pretty white, uh, and we need to have uh, minority folks, African American folks. And he talked to that. You can see his presentation. He's our keynote. And we also had a guy named Tim Beatley, who's a professor that developed the biophilic cities movement. And this is a new way of looking at cities to understand the value of nature um, and to create cities and urban areas uh, and residents' lives that are, that are integral, that depend on nature. And this is how, how we do it. And he's going to be joining us this next year. We're creating a campaign called the Biophilic Cities Movement, which will address all of the issues that, that we are uh, talking about. Um, and he's written some great books, uh, Biophilic Cities, Coastal Resiliency, and his most recent book, The Bird-Friendly City, which is one of my favorite books because it talks about how you can use um, cities to help conserve birds. So stay tuned for the Biophilic City campaign. We can do this. Uh, we can achieve cultural transformation. Uh, we can find a better future. Um, we can survive and we can thrive. Survive again, that's important, but we can figure out how to do it. We can thrive. We just have to build the foundation and then make it work. And that is my program, Dennis. Sorry if I went a little bit late. Not at all, Jay. That's a great program. Uh, let's see, first of all, if we have any questions, uh, Melissa. Yes. Uh, first question, is Jay working with Newell Nussbaumer and his Flutterby Festival? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, Newell, Newell and I are friends. Newell, um, that's a great festival. We've been working with him for a couple of years. Um, so yes, and he was one of our sponsors at the Birds on Niagara Festival and gave us a lot of coverage. So yeah, yes, the answer is yes. Next question, what are your thoughts on the removal of the Skyway and all the various design ideas? Well, it's a complicated question. Um, I, the, the principal reason for taking the Skyway down is what? To encourage development where? On the Outer Harbor. That's, that's one of the motivations. So that concerns me. As part of this institutional failure, the state strategy, which ECHTC, Erie Canal Harbor Development Corporation, um, embraces and DOT embraces. Uh, so that's an issue. Now, in terms of its uh, attractiveness, um, there's a lot of ways to, uh, I think, use that, that Skyway, um, uh, including for pedestrians and bikes and uh, greenery. 
Uh, I think that one of the issues with taking it down also would be rerouting uh, the, the traffic. And um, that's a complicated thing that hasn't really been resolved or hasn't even been addressed. One of the main um, alternatives involves putting a road through Tift Nature Preserve. I mean, people say it's not much a Tift Nature Preserve, but what is it, you know, 50 yards uh, or more? And that's, that's, not, that's not good. Um, and so uh, I have some issues with taking the Skyway down. I think it's, a, it's an issue that our community has to be more involved with, and um, I'm concerned about it. I love the Skyway. I love being up there. You know, I understand uh, the Congress New Urbanism which promoted the idea of putting sprawl in the outer harbor also promotes the idea of taking down those large infrastructures, those large bridges. Um, so it's a thing, but um, it's not a conservation thing. I think you kind of answered this question, but just in case, uh, what is the role of the Skyway in preserving the outer harbor? Well, that's a good question. Um, it obviously has its impacts. Uh, it's loud. Um, uh, we, but it's not the loudest thing out there. I've been down at Times Beach during breeding season of birds or amphibians, and you can't even hear yourself talk, one, because of traffic. So noise pollution is really big. Also, concerts at canal size can be pretty devastating in terms of noise pollution on the Outer Harbor. So those are anti-conservation moves. They're moving concerts now out to the Outer Harbor. Uh, that's part of the new plan, um, and that's not necessarily an environmental move. So the main thing that I see now is that if you take the Skyway down, you're going to be potentially impacting Tift Nature Preserve. You're also going to be potentially promoting inappropriate development um, on the Outer Harbor. That's one of the intentions of doing it. We, we've just spent a lot of money fixing it. It's good for another 40 years. Uh, so um, it's a political move, and I'm concerned about it. Those are all the questions in the chat right now. Oh, never mind. Here's another one. <laughs> Are you familiar with the CLCPA legislation and the second part of that legislation that is trying to get past the CCIA? Um, yes and no. Um, maybe there's a more pointed part of that question. That was all there was to it. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Yes and no. I'm, I'm, a, I'm aware of it, <laughs> but you know, I, I could probably learn a lot more about it. And if you had a question that I could give a more detailed answer to, I would. Jay, uh, let, let's just chat for a second. Sure. Obviously, uh, economic development is important. So you're going to have a whole bunch of the public uh, wisely saying, let's, uh, let's start from that as the bottom line. What you're drawing our attention to is that, wait a minute, we all live on this planet and there's a, a changing time, and we better uh, start to come to terms with that changing time. It's, we call it climate change, uh, uh, words like that. How do we, in a lifelong learning perspective, uh, that it isn't just about, oh, I got my degree and I'm done, but that the world we're living on is changing and transforming itself. It almost feels at so many levels. What's the best course for creating dialogue, honest dialogue, where people can hear both sides of the big picture so we can better understand the smaller pieces. In one hand, the Outer Harbor is a small piece of a global story. That's what you're pointing to with, uh, with your wonderful graphics. How do you suggest, I, I'm using the library here, but what other methods? We have so many colleges, universities, uh, uh, corporations that have, uh, uh, you know, vested interest in in uh, both sides of that coin being discussed. What what suggestions do you have? Well, I mean, that's that's a fundamental question. It's so important and it's so hard to answer. But here's the thing: I think the way we conduct our economy in 2021 is really arcane. It's based on things that don't necessarily recognize the value of the environment, for instance, or the value of our culture, for instance. And I say that because uh, they recognize profit over, and I used the term earlier, externalities. So when you measure profit, you measure the cost of the board feet of lumber rather than the cost to the planet and to society of losing the forest. Those are real, real numbers and we're paying for them now because climate change is expensive and climate change is, a, I'm gonna say it's a failure of capitalism. It's a failure of other kinds of economies too, but it's a failure 
it's an institutional failure and not recognizing those costs which are borne upon us people who the economy is supposed to benefit is a mistake. We have health costs affiliated with uh, climate change. Uh, we have um, cultural costs, including wars uh, affiliated with climate change. So anyway, that's one way to think about it, Dennis, is, is rethink how we measure our economy and how we profit. Another way to think about that is what's the local economy? Uh, local businesses, uh, building, um, building a, a way to do local business, even large businesses is, is more important than having a business come up from out of town and take the money Pay, pay the wages and not give a heck about the community that they're taking it out of. Uh, local businesses have more concern about the people that live here and the quality of life here, and that involves the environment and the cultural uh, culture that we have here, the arts. So um, those are just some things to think about. And um, schools, I mean, libraries, these are, these are not unknown things. And uh, I know a lot of people know about it. And we just have to change our institutional mindsets um, about that. And that's not an easy job because we're dealing with people who have a lot of money and a lot of power and a lot of power to manipulate us. Um, Good answer. Uh, certainly uh, we're on the same page. What we'll do at this end uh, with the Imagine series is to continue to have programs that focus on nature, uh, the economy. Uh, uh, we're going to have uh, uh, Joan Bozer and, and friends, I call it, uh, uh, coming up here in April. So we're, we're going to keep having this as a discussion item. That's the, the least and the best I can, I can offer uh, folks. folks we're Dennis, gonna Dennis there are just two comments I just want to throw in here. Um, Linda Good. says, okay. if you are concerned with the economy, we had better protect the earth and stop climate change. The costs to clean up disasters is astronomical already. You can support conservation from an economic perspective. And then David says, seems to me a regenerative design approach is a good start. Is this what Jay is in alignment with? There's a question to you, Jay, that terminology. Oops. Yes, re regenerative uh, design is definitely a part of it. And again, the devil's in the details. Uh, I like native plants as opposed to other plants that might regenerate themselves, but it's, 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 it's exactly the right thing to be doing if you're an architect or a landscaper, um, for sure. Well, and, and it raises a good point. Most cities don't have a school of architecture at a graduate level in its backyard. Uh, perhaps design should be inclusive of uh, nature and uh, uh, landscape design as well as uh, the outer harbor, how we design our future should be part of maybe a curriculum uh, component, at least of, of the School of Architecture. Dennis, a, I, Dennis, I want to go back to Tim Beatley uh, and Biophilia Network and Biophilic Cities. Uh, this is exactly what you're talking about. He's a professor of architecture at the University of Virginia, and, his, and he's one of the people who started the Smart Growth Network also. So mm -hmm. learning to be a biophilic city, a city to not only uh, learn to live with nature, to be, be a part of nature, buildings, parks, streets, uh, everything uh, is part of what you'll be learning a lot more about as we bring this campaign here. And so, um, let's, so anyway, let's, work, that's, let's work together to do so. All right. Uh, we're going to have to sign off and uh, uh, folks uh, join us next week. Uh, I thank you, Jay, for a great presentation today. Uh, and thank you folks for joining us today. Uh, next week, same time, same Zoom link. Uh, when we talk with Jane Fisher, she's from Canisius College, and uh, uh, the topic most uh, timely, envisioning disease, gender, and war, and speaks of women's narratives of the 1918 influenza pandemic. Should be interesting. I'm Dennis Galecki. Uh, have a great afternoon. Be well. Good day.